Good day. I'm John Fernandez. Welcome to eNewsline Live from AACSB's World Headquarters in Tampa, Florida. Today's topic of discussion will focus on the MBA degree, how it has evolved, new trends, and the impact it has on global business and society. Although demand for graduates with a professional degree is rising, uh, questions remain uh, about its true value and how business schools should be enhancing the MBA curriculum uh, and, and uh, pedagogical approach uh, to better prepare business managers and leaders for the global business realities of today. Our guest is Dean Paul Danos of the Tuck School of Business of Dartmouth College, uh, the world's oldest MBA program. Dean Danos has been an active reviewer of major business schools for AACSB accreditation and is more importantly widely regarded as an expert in the business school industry. With Paul's vast experience in management education and knowledge uh, of the current trends and demands for the MBA programs worldwide, we are grateful for having this opportunity to have him join us here today. Well, Paul, this is a very special e Newsline Live for me. Uh, you were one of the first in management education to welcome a non-management education as CEO. Uh, and I recall visiting you back in 2000 at the Tuck School. Uh, one of the wonderful schools of management worldwide. So we're very excited to have you here, and uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm happy to be here, John. Our practice is we get right into the questions, and uh, that's what the audience wants to hear. Uh, over 230,000 MBA students were enrolled in AACSB-accredited schools in the 2011-12 academic year. That's an 11% jump from five years ago at these accredited schools. Uh, and I want to point out, too, that um, uh, we're sort of the hurrier we go, the behinder we get. Uh, when last we talked, I was telling you we accredited about 5% of the world's business schools, uh, but uh, it's 667. Now we're down about 4% to show you the growth <laughs> worldwide. But at AACSB schools, we're up about 11%. Question is, uh, from your observation and experience, uh, what are some of the main uh, factors for the rise in the popularity of the MBA degree? I think the, by far the dominant factor is the sophistication and growth of private enterprise around the world. It, it, it's a massive growth. If you go back and compare, especially Asia, with the kind of business that was being done 20 years ago and what's being done now, what's pro projected for the future. I think we have a very strong pattern of growth because as those businesses become more sophisticated, more global, they want much more educated and universally trained people. And that's where we come in. Uh, so I think that the growth in business worldwide is, is pushing the growth of the demand for MBAs. Now, of course, the MBA degree has lasted, and we'll talk about this a lot, I know in this interview, but has lasted because I think that the great business schools are very responsive to those leadership needs and the training needs of the people that are slated to run businesses. Well, there are all types of MBA programs, and, and we have to consider that that AACSB accreditation is an instrument of the developed world uh, with only uh, some modicum of growth in the developing world. There's a massive world out there, and, uh, uh, and I think that's driving demand much higher than what we're seeing in just uh, AACSB accredited schools. Well, we're going to go back a little ways now, not too long, but uh, you received your MBA from the University of New Orleans. It must have been a wonderful place. I think that I'd probably have to eat my way through school in New Orleans, but that's, that's a wonderful origin. Uh, how did your MBA benefit you personally and, and perhaps uh, and professionally and perhaps personally? Uh, and um, uh, also, how was your experience different from the students that are earning an MBA today? Well, I was one that was involved in an early version of a part-time program. I worked full time in a major corporation as an accountant when I got out of college. And I always wanted to be an academic. And I wanted to test it out and see what it was like. And, and so I use it as kind of a path toward understanding what academics were like. So I got to know professors, et cetera. 
And, and I was really interested in the conceptual development and, and understanding what was behind the courses, et cetera. And, and of course, it helped me in my job, too. Uh, you know, I was working full time and trying to go up the ladder in my job, then not quite knowing whether I should dive into a PhD program sooner rather than later. And so I, I was working that out at the time. But in those days, as you remember, we had a lot of energy. I could work all day and actually went to school at night and on weekends. And so that's the kind of thing that I did. It, I, I'm very grateful for that opportunity to continue my education. There's so many ways to continue your education, even if you can't you know, participate in the full-time programs, such as the Tuck program that requires you to be there full-time. And uh, it has very wonderful features. And I didn't get all of those features in my program back then, but it gave me a lot of an introduction to higher level thinking about business. Well, you've made, uh, you've made two disclosures. Uh, uh, we're both accountants. We admit that now. So uh, don't change the dial. We're, we're, we, we've been at this for a long time. Um, and the second thing is, as I re recall, we had very little electronic uh, stimuli, certainly not the omnipotence of email and its potential 24-hour invasion of your space. So I, I do think we work very hard but I also thought life was more uh, orderly and planned as it relates to supplementing one's work. And, and, and we can see that with the flexibility of programs now. Well, in your 18 years as dean at the Tuck School of Business, uh, how have you seen the M a MBA degree and its focus change, uh, uh, including the types of students pursuing management education uh, and the faculty delivering it? There are several mega trends. Certainly globalization has changed the complexion of, of a school of that kind. Uh, we have many more international students with all kinds of experience coming uh, to Tuck uh, now, more than we had 18 years ago, higher percentage. We have more women in our program than we had 18 years ago. And, and the, the students are bringing with them uh, different perspectives. I'd say students today are much more concerned with social impact than they were in the past. They're, they're, they're concerned with ethics. They're concerned with, of course, the basics of business and the advanced courses in business. They always have been concerned with that, and I think we've always done a good job in that respect, the rigor part. There's so much more experiential, so many more offshore experiences. Uh, the richness of the programming is, is, is different. We have leadership courses now. We have required social and ethics coverage. We have um, treks, projects all over the world, uh, in addition to the classic courses. And within the classic courses now, there's a lot of blending of technology-based learning and face-to-face -face learning. The one thing that still is true, and I think it's better now than it's ever been, certainly at Tuck, and I think at many schools, is I think the faculty are teaching exciting, relevant uh, topics based on their expertise, and that expertise is based on their research. So I'm kind of counter-cultural. I believe that research, done at its best, keeps faculty very attuned yes. to the breaking edge and, and to what's going to happen next in business. So I believe in that model of a scholar teacher. And we emphasize that a lot, especially in small scale, where people can really get to know them. All of that is developed. So, Today's MBA, when it's done at its best level, is certainly way beyond just transferring of knowledge. That, that is a real experience, and I really think there's an opportunity for truly transforming people's lives. I, unlike almost any program that I know, the people who come change their attitudes, change their, their aspirations, and they achieve a lot in life. 
well, faculty were good when I uh, went to business school, but I, but I think by and large they're unbelievable now. And one of the steps that AACSB is, is nudging the industry towards, and you know that's like moving a giant uh, cruise ship, uh, is encouraging faculty to think about the impact of their research uh, and to do that more systematically and for schools to, uh, to present that, N not as a short-term impact. Mm -hmm. In fact, historical impact and plan for future is just as good, in fact, better. But it is a way of saying to the outside world that, wait a minute, the research that's being done in business schools that we've spent 60 years building a climate to is relevant, it's of impact, and we're going to do a better job of demonstrating to you. So I, I really think that, that faculty are, have, have uh, uh -huh. made their... And, and I, I, I agree. I, I, actual discovery and, and their knowledge is one thing. It's very important. It's a lot more relevant than some people give it credit for. The other thing is students should be exposed to the way faculty think about knowledge. It's really an important part of being a leader in business. Faculty look at things differently because of their training and because of their pursuit of new knowledge. And they've got to defend it at a very fundamental level. That takes a certain kind of precision demonstration of precision of methods, it's really critical. And students should be exposed to that. That's why I don't believe that we should stray from our scholar-teacher model that much. I mean, of course, there are great people who don't do research that do great jobs in covering material and, and, and teaching students and inspiring students. But at the heart of what we do in, in these academic institutions, is to have faculty who really are deep, really understand how to get new knowledge and to how to test it. Let, let them be, let students be exposed to them on a very close basis and they'll, they'll be a different kind of person. They'll think about problems differently. And I like that skepticism and that precision. That should be mixed in with all of the other things we try to achieve in building a leader. As all of you know, once again this year, we were unable to fund a Super Bowl commercial, so I don't think uh, everyone knows this, but it is very important to consider the quality of the faculty in choosing a business school. It's not uh, all can produce as effectively as others, and s some programs, uh, and still others, are much more effective at building that strong faculty than maybe others care to do with different models of, uh, of reward in their system. So uh, be thinking about that if you're choosing a business school. You know, this next question, I don't even think we would have asked this uh, 15 years ago. It's certainly not part of it. And it's, what is the main value that an MBA can provide to industry, to business, uh, and to society? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, it's the talent and the spirit of the people that come to the program. Uh, it's important that businesses have people who have been exposed to a wide variety of best practices and what's behind those best practices and the testing of those best practices. And it's difficult to get that from just an experience within a company. Our education kind of summarizes it and distills a lot of knowledge. Now, it's not everything. Of course, a leader continuously grows through experience and life experience and business experience. But we can bring them up to that launching pad that when they're ready to actually start developing uh, their leadership skills. And the people that come through a great program, I think, are ready for that. They certainly have been exposed to a lot of the best practices of the world. They have built up their skills, communication skills, and uh, leadership skills, and all kinds of analytical skills, of course. But I, I think that we're able to condense that, and then they're ready to truly build their experiential skills while they launch into their careers. So I think, that, I think it's something that's very valuable, I think, the reason why these programs have stayed successful, in Tuck's case for 112 years, 
I think it's because the people that come out have a spirit, a can-do spirit, and they've been screened for their knowledge and for their potential. So I think businesses see that as a value, a valuable a part of their personnel development process. If they didn't, why would they pay? Why would they, why would they recruit the students in such numbers? And, and, and the numbers are still fabulous. We have at Tuck in 112 years, our last three years have been among the best placement years we've ever had. And that's in the face of some headwinds in a recessionary time. So there's a tremendous demand for the quality and talent that, that are coming out of MBA programs. One of the things uh, that, that you mentioned about, you know, tech sustainability in both high quality recruitment of students, faculty, and then high quality placements. I have to ask you a question, it's a little bit loaded, but um, do you think that, that schools that, that have that, that right mix uh, need to think about global sourcing of students and faculty and global placement of students as opposed to their historical backyard marketplace? On, on, there's no doubt. Uh, I would say now, in the last 10 years, uh, our students are placed in companies that have more business growth potential outside of the U.S. than inside of the U.S. and probably more growth sales outside of the U.S. So almost all of the people that hire our students have an external, non-U.S. strategy for growth. Now, the U.S. is still a giant market, of course, and people can spend a lot of their lives in the U.S., but it's no longer viable for a leader of many, many big U.S. businesses to think of themselves as a U.S. manager. They, they'll probably, in their careers, be spending a considerable amount of time managing, leading, running operations in, in other parts of the world, in other cultures. And so the, the backyard placement really doesn't apply. Uh, the one place that's kind of an exception is pure entrepreneurship. I'd say there are a lot of local entrepreneurs that are doing something as starting up. But if they're successful, they're going to grow into a global and some of them are uh, global from the get-go, but they'll grow into global companies if they're successful. Uh, but, but the vast majority of top MBA students are going into companies that whose vast majority of their revenues are coming from outside of the U.S. Yeah. You know, in the context, you mentioned entrepreneurs, and uh, I think of the perfect marriage in entrepreneurship, but with the precept of innovation, and uh, how do you feel about business students as being important catalyst facilitators of innovations in a multidisciplinary effort to create innovation? What would you thought about? Well, that? you know, there's two aspects to entrepreneurship and innovation. One is start your own business. And it's a very interesting thing. I've traced Tuck students, and I'm sure it's representative of many uh, full-time programs. Maybe 10%, 15% go, become entrepreneurs from the beginning. But close to 50% and sometime in their career will be running their own business. <laughs> and so people become entrepreneurs. MBAs tend to become entrepreneurs later in life, even if they start in a multinational business, a, a giant bank or a giant consulting firm or a giant corporation. So, so that's, it's part of the future of many people, and many people have that dream of being running their own shop. You know? and, and, but there's another part of entrepreneurship, and that is the spirit. Every corporation wants their managers to be entrepreneurial. They want them to innovate. And so the spirit, whether you're working for a big company or you're working for your own company, the spirit is kind of the same. And so we we see most of our students taking entrepreneurship-related courses at Tuck, not just the ones that will start and launch a business right away, but all of them think about that as kind of a window into innovation and how innovation can be pursued inside of any type of company. So it's been 40-plus 
maybe 45 years of, uh, with this entrepreneurship thing. Is it really a discipline now? It's not a discipline in the, in the classic sense where you have a department head and, and they, like, as finance would be in marketing and other you know, operations and organizational behavior, accounting. It, but there are people in these other areas that are specialists. That some of their research is in, or they'll teach a course in entrepreneurship. And then there are also specialists that teach an entrepreneurial course. And we have incubators. We have specialized assets. So if someone's interested in it, they can come to a school, full-time MBA program, and actually take several courses. For instance, at Tuck, we require a first-year project where you put five people together and they spend a significant amount of time working on a project. Half of them are consulting projects. Half of them are entrepreneurial projects. So half of our students actually spend a term, in essence, looking at an entrepreneurial effort and building a business plan for it, and interviewing people and seeing if it could be launched. Not all of them do it. So it is a big part of most MBA students' lives to be exposed to it, even though it's not a required course, and even though there really isn't a formal department in our case for entrepreneurship. There are people interested in entrepreneurship, and you can get a lot of exposure to it. And a lot of our alumni who visit are entrepreneurs that come to the incubator, that come to our various centers that deal with entrepreneurship. So uh, you can get a lot of exposure to entrepreneurship at a, at a top school. Well, this next question, we, we've wandered into in part, but I'm going to be a little more specific. Uh, what we are seeing an increasing demand for MBA graduates in emerging economies such as Latin America and Asia, Middle East, uh, uh, and, and I think that's an understatement. Uh, how important is expanding MBA education specifically in those regions? Well, I think it's going to be very important because just take China alone. China has in the hundreds of business schools, maybe a couple of hundred in total that are accredited <laughs> by the state. You know better than I do. That's pretty big. <laughs> but they need thousands. Yeah. To, I mean, when you think of the size and think of how business oriented they're going to be and they're becoming, for them to be anywhere close to the saturation that we have of business schools and business education, uh, I see a massive build out in the next 50 years in places like China and India and most of Asia, lots of Latin America. Europe is pretty uh, developed and the US is pretty developed. North America is pretty developed in, in, in having business schools. But these, some of these big population countries really are not that developed in terms of the numbers of actual schools. And then to bring them up to a level that would be comparable it's going to take a long time. And I'm sure they'll do it eventually, but it's going to take a long time. So I'm very bullish on our getting a lot of students from those areas for a long, long time, because I, I don't see that there'll be enough uh, supply to meet the demand for, for the foreseeable future. But they're going to go there. Uh, business, I think of Business education is kind of, especially MBA education, is kind of a stem cell. It's a kind of stem cell of education. Anyone from any area between the ages of 25 and 30 can come to an MBA program and change, fundamentally change their direction, change their lives. There's not many programs that can do that. Can take almost any great input and convert it into the target expertise, target career. That is a that is a massive um, quality or value added for people, and so I'm very very bullish on business education. I think the same process is going to happen in India. The same process is going to happen in China, and so there will be this industry is going to be for a long long time forever. It's going to be uh, extremely important for society. I think the mobility of the degree is tremendous. And, and as you point out, about a year ago, we had uh, Yingyi Chen, the uh, dean of uh, Tsinghua University, talking about management education in China and, and beyond in Asia, but still 
such an, a big topic. It, it was an important to focus on China. And surely, as, as you say, I think at the time, China might have had 18 or 1900 uh, business schools. And uh, while AACSB is an important player between uh, mainland China and Hong Kong, we probably accredit around 12. So the Chinese are, are building uh, an accreditation system very close to AACSB because of this massive need for production of, of quality graduates to service their industries. And, and that, that's what we have to, as you've mentioned, I don't want to be redundant, but, but thinking about management education in the global context is much different than thinking about it in, in the United States, Western Europe, uh, marketplace solely, but it's, it's a significantly emerging market still in many places. Uh, and, and they've got to build up, they've got to have PhD programs if they're going to copy the U.S. or East, or the Western Europe type of model where you have PhDs teaching or controlling most of the academics. Um, it takes, takes years, decades to even start that process. And our PhD program certainly can't supply everything that's going to be needed. So that, that it's a very interesting question as to how that volume and quality is disseminated throughout the world. It's certainly not, I don't see it as a threat to the U.S. kind of dominance in, 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 this, in the business school world. The U.S. has a massive number of great schools, and it's always been the leader in producing great PhDs in business. But I don't see that this growth is going to be a threat. What well, we have to do, all of us, have to make sure that our programs really add value and just keep working it as hard as we can, just like any, any kind of business would, and making sure that our students get value for, for the tuition dollar and they get opportunities. I don't think there's any short run or even middle run threat to our being able to deliver. Technology might be more of a threat for some schools than is globalization. I think globalization is really an opportunity. Well, well following on, and I, this goes beyond uh, the developing world to some developed areas, but I, but I think we all would kind of agree, even our European friends, that the, that the modern MBA was invented in the United States. But uh, are there significant differences among MBA programs in the United States and those delivered in different parts of the world, uh, and, and I, there's a way you can take this because we're talking about Europe and Asia and the Middle East. It, it, it's not an easy to answer uh, question, but I, I think uh, the question is, is, are these programs uh, moving more towards a U.S. model, uh, or are they developing their own, their own direction? And, and yeah. that? I think at some levels they're very similar. If you were to take a marketing class in almost any top school in the world, no matter where it is, it, it would be very similar. You might emphasize a few things differently, but it, it, that wouldn't be the big difference. The big difference I see is in Europe, they're tending toward shorter duration. Mm -hmm. They tend toward like an 11-month MBA or a 12-month MBA, whereas we have the year, two full academic years, which is more like 21 months of all in. And, we, and we've always believed in putting that internship three month period between the two academic years. So that's, that's the nature of our full-time program. But of course, there's so many models now. There's part-time models, and there's weekend models, and distance education models. And so the, the whole thing is changing. Even there are some one-year programs that, that I know of, uh, kind of like a one-year program for people who have had previous education in business. And so, but the fundamental, most of the top schools in the U.S. are two full years, MBA schools, two full years with a residency or a, an internship in, in between the two years. And they have a, mostly a core year and mostly an elective year, not completely, but it, it looks very simple structurally. Some of the top schools in other parts of the world do it exactly the same. But there are, I say in Europe especially, there's a lot of examples of shorter programs. And, and I think the, the big churn too is taking place at the undergraduate level. That's changing and it's blending into these master's degrees that are just 
add-ons from an undergraduate degree with no experience required. So now we're going to be having masters of management courses, a lot of them, yeah. Europe is full of them, and the US is it's growing, uh, where you just go for one year on top of a liberal arts or science kind of undergraduate, and, and you then are launched into a career, uh, probably at an analyst level. Maybe you'll come back for the MBA at age 28, maybe not, I, I, that's all to be seen. And then there's going to be some pushback at the undergraduate level as to what does it mean for a four year, should it be a three year degree like as it is in Europe? I think there's a lot of questioning of the basic model. But one thing, again, to be bullish about business schools, I think almost every campus is thinking, how can we make our undergraduate education more relevant? And of course, people look to business schools to be helpful in making it. One thing we're great at is relevance. Most of our students get really good jobs at the end at, at really high pay at the very top schools. So that makes that, that value proposition is pretty high for business schools compared to many degrees that are not aimed at that. They're aimed at a broad foundation for future professional work. Well, for the practical ones, they're eventually aimed at business schools. It just might take them a little longer. Might take them a little longer. <laughs> Okay, now we're moving into some controversy, which we all like. Uh, critics, at least partly, uh, blame the MBA for the world's most recent economic crisis, uh, stating that factors like inadequate leadership preparation and excessive focus on uh, uh, the profit generation, particularly in the short term, uh, shareholder value, uh, prompted uh, the financial meltdown. What are your views on such opinions? Are there certain arguments raised by critics th that you agree with? Well, I, I think that the critics are, are correct to some degree. And there's a time warp involved, though. All the people I know that were involved, the real players in the financial crisis, got their degrees 30, 40 years ago. So they weren't taking the modern MBA. Now, I'm not saying the modern MBA would have inoculated them from those pressures you mentioned. So the, the pressures are pressures of imprudence and risk taking and profit uh, or, or reward concentration and, and poor reward structures, short term reward structures. All of that could have happened uh, with any generation of students, any generation of business people. I think that the business schools have a responsibility. It just shows how powerful the leaders of these big organizations are. Let's say half of them were MBAs. That's about right. About half of those type of leaders were MBAs. And they were, say, in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. So they've been out of school for a while. I think the modern MBA, today's MBA at, 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 at many schools, would have given them pause in terms of ethics, social responsibility. But there's something else we need to do. We're really working on this. I think we've got to go back to some extent to the basics to make sure people understand the models they're dealing with. See, this crisis, I think, was based as much on ignorance of these risk assessments. And that's a technical issue. And the notion of how the markets for the regulators, which, which weren't mostly MBAs, mostly economists and, and lawyers, believing so strongly that markets would, would, would regulate the actions of, of banks. So there were a lot of misperceptions, and I think that could be partially cured by deeper, more fundamental understanding of models and of the skill, of, of the kinds of the way we teach fundamentals of finance and economics and accounting, et cetera. So I think that most people look at this and say, we need more ethics and social responsibility. I agree with that. But I think we also need more depth and analytical understanding. That combination. And one other thing, you've got to be brave. You can't sit in that boardroom as they did and never raise your hand and pretend you understand things that you don't understand. Right. That's one thing I've learned is, Many, many people who were players in this tragedy 
did not understand the models they were dealing with. Now, is that a continuous education issue? Is that a hubris issue? Where, or is that just is that just cowardice, where you just are afraid to raise your hand and say, I don't get it. Slow down. Explain this to me again. How does this work? I, I think that there are a lot of issues of making sure that our students have the foundation to be brave about their wanting to understand what's under these claims about models, about, about, about innovations. It, it, I think that that's what it, sh it showed to me is that there were too many people that went along and didn't slow it down because I think the atmosphere in the boardroom just didn't allow for that. That's, that's the truism. We should have been listening to Arthur Levitt more in the, late, uh, in the late 90s, but we have some really close to home examples where you know, all the king's men, the auditors, the accountants, the lawyers, the managers, the, the CEO or sing a particular tune and a board member that shows up for, a, for one day at most and is listening to all of these speculative uh, uh, areas of emphasis uh, have to go along. And the regulators went along too. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, PhDs in economics were making big mistakes as to how these models really work out in practice. And, and so it, there was a lot of blame to go around and uh, let's hope that we tighten up on that, and and let's hope we infuse our current graduates with the backbone to say, if I don't understand that, it must be something wrong with this model. You exactly. Know? You, you, if I don't understand that, either my education was bad, or you're trying to bamboozle me on this and, and trying to shove something through way before the analysis has been done, and I, that's one thing that I do see in our approach that could be adjusted. I think the emphasis on case teaching and not slowing that down and looking at the underpinnings of the research behind the claims and behind the solutions, I think we overemphasize answers that just, they, just looking at solutions is not enough. You've got to go beyond that. And so, a, a straight dose of cases. I, I never did. I never did think that that was. The, it was good pedagogy, but not a straight dose. Where you, in there, I, so we've inserted a lot of tuck of what I would call deep dives on the research side, so that the students at least see some examples, of the underpinnings of these solutions, and not just the solutions. You can get, you can get mesmerized by just looking at solutions. Yeah. Well, I have to admit, 40 years ago, they taught us about groupthink in business school, but I don't think we really learned it as much as we learned uh, obedience to align with the organization's preferences. So now I, I think it's the, the important point you raise is that, that constructive skepticism, doing the right thing, is important. That's a difference. Continuing on with our approach, uh, a good friend of, of yours, an individual I'm very familiar with, uh, in his book, Managers, not MBAs, Henry Mintzberg challenges the traditional form uh, of the MBA and argues that programs overemphasize the science and deemphasize the experience needed uh, to become a successful manager. Well, uh, how can business schools uh, respond to this criticism? Do you think they're doing so? What, what are your thoughts on Henry's comments? Certainly, I think that. If you roll the clock back 20 years, there was a lot of valid criticism of business schools for being too strong on the quant side, very soft on the soft skill side. But that's changed. I, I think there's a blend now of experiential exposure, teamwork, uh, working on real problems that I think right the ship a bit. But he, I think Henry's right in the sense of 10 years of experience post MBA, of course, should, should make for a wiser, better leader. That doesn't mean the MBA wasn't a good starting point. That's where he and I always argue. The MBA is not intended to say it's a fully formed leader comes out who has have, had all the experience you need to be a great leader. Who's claiming that? So it's kind of a, 
a straw man argument in a way because we're not claiming that. We're claiming that we do a great job of taking experienced, broad-minded, well-educated 25 to 30-year-old, give them skills and attitudes and sensitivities that allow them then add it to 10 years of experience that will allow them to continue to grow as a leader. So I don't think we even have an argument. That's what I always say when I argue with them, is that we don't have an argument. It's just a time warp. He's thinking that we're saying they're fully formed when they come out. Well, who's fully formed? Even a 50-year-old still needs more experience. I mean, there's no limit to how much experience can help. But look at that crisis. All those people, all of those people had tons of experience. All of those people had made it through the ranks way beyond business school, and they still made mistakes. So experience alone is not the thing either. And so we've got to blend all of this. Uh, to say one approach is the only approach is not true. So Henry, good program, just not scalable. We invite you to come on ENL sometime and, <laughs> and talk about your, your perspective. Uh, just a little more, and, and, and you, you've probably figured out that uh, uh, our normal uh, time frame for ENL is 40 to 45 minutes, but this subject is much too important and, and expansive, so we're gonna, we're gonna press on, and we, we hope you stay with us. Uh, you talked a little bit about case studies, and maybe this doesn't need as much uh, uh, depth and discussion, but uh, for business schools, case studies have long been used as the teaching method, a learning method in MBA classrooms, undergraduates too. Uh, although, they, although they expose students to real life business conflicts requiring analysis, problem solving, and action uh, planning, some argue that they are, as you do, are not really adequate as compared to real life experience. Uh, they have their narrowness. H how would you characterize the case studies continued value in the MBA curriculum, uh, and are there areas in the programs that you think uh, could enhance practical knowledge beyond what you've, you've covered so mm -hmm. far? Now, I think case studies are really great. I think you learn a lot in a short period of time. I think the interaction among the students, when it's in the hands of a great case <laughs> professor, a person that really knows how to do it, I think it can be a, a good experience for students. I just question a steady diet, diet. Of only that or lots of it. I, I, I think that, but I think that it, one thing it does, you, you're not, people are not going to learn unless they, you get their attention. And a good case will get your attention. And it does make you active. Uh, I think that passive learning is, is very wasteful. And so, the great thing about cases is it's usually based on something real. Somebody's gone out and got that data together and interviewed people. And it's usually about a very interesting topic. So it gets people's attention. It makes students usually present something and do some analysis. So there's a lot of good features. Um, but there's a lot more to understanding the solutions and best practices than just looking at the way those cases are set up. So I think as part of a pedagogical system, I think they're very good. And we certainly use them. But we have a much more of a blended system in some schools. We don't use them for everything. We don't use them for some courses are basically case courses, but it's, it's not the dominant uh, delivery method at time. So the message is eat your vegetables, but don't forget the protein. <laughs> Uh, MBA programs uh, have increased their, their global orientation in recent years. Are there any other aspects of MBA ed education, as we draw towards the ends of the prepared questions, uh, that are too important to ignore that we, that we haven't discussed? Now, you know, the MBA programs typically have requirements, and often they're designed to be built. I mean, you take one course before you take another course, and it's designed that way so that you build your knowledge. Uh, but then when you talk to students as to the highlights, I would say I've talked to thousands of students uh, who have talked about the highlights of their program. Of course, that great professor that inspired them from all the disciplines, it's amazing the different disciplines that inspire people. It depends on the personality of that professor. So you get the, that's part of it. The, the inspirational professor is, is something that you can't 
design. You either have those people or you don't, and you can help them get that way to some extent, but it's different. It's something that's almost innate in the professor. And then, and then you, of course, that required coverage. It would be odd to think of a business school that wouldn't require accounting, finance, marketing, operations. You, yeah. have, to, you have to have that kind of coverage of the waterfront. But then there are some things that aren't covered everywhere, and I think it should be. Because some people say it can't be taught, such as ethics, social responsibility, leadership. I think those things can be taught, taught in a sense, not completely. They won't take with everyone the same way. But I do think that going through examples, making people self-reflective about their leadership, I think there are things that can be done that help people get in that position that if they want to advance their ethics and social responsibility and leadership, that they can be helped. To say that it can't be completely taught, and that's a justification for not covering it, I think is a mistake. So you see those now, I talk, those are all required parts of the, of, of the MBA program. And it just wasn't in the old days, and, and, and it isn't in many schools now. And I, I think it's based on thinking that may not be quite right. I, I think you can, not everything that's taught can achieve 100% effectiveness, and certainly something like leadership or ethics can't, but I think it can help. I think it's better to have seen many examples of ethics failures in a business setting than never to have seen any, you know? The same thing with leadership. I think it's better to be reflective and get some feedback about how you're coming over as a leader than not to get any. So it's not like it's going to make you uh, the world's best leader, but I think it's going to allow you to achieve um, things that you may not have been able to achieve. So we do things like that that are not really conventional, but we think are really important. Just like having a, a course that has students work in teams and work on projects and that make you the world's best consultant, it gives you a, a leg up in, in a consulting practice. I mean, you've done it, you've been trained by consultants, you bring in people from the real world. And you try it on a client while you're in school. I don't see how that, that doesn't help you a bit becoming a, something like a great consultant. So the, 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 the perfect shouldn't be the enemy of the good in education. Sometimes people won't do it because they know it can't do everything. But that's, that's not a good reason. It's not a good excuse. Well, higher education as a whole is in an, an exciting time. And I think that we put that in quotes. Uh, with a growth, the growth in innovations and program features, such as an expanded use of technology, including online delivery. There are a lot of things surrounding that which make it exciting. Uh, how have technological uh, and delivery enhancements impacted the MBA degree, and do you foresee further impacts? Oh, yes. No, I, I, and that's partly because the technology is getting better. Partly it's because our clients, our students, are going to learn differently because they will have been doing it all their lives, even in grade school, yeah. at home. So that, that the way we teach is going to have to change, and we've already changed it. At Tuck, there are several core courses that have parts of the lectures and the basic coverage online. People can even test themselves before they go to class. So the classes are being more and more turned over to interaction and discussion and challenge and group um, solutions. And the actual technical work, looking at the basic models, are being lectured outside of the face-to-face -face classroom. So that, even in a classic program like Tuck, which is so much a face-to-face -face thing, we're using technology in and around the classroom. But we're also using it in other delivery. We have a Master's of Healthcare Delivery Science, where People who are in charge of hospitals and clinics around the world take a master's degree, mostly in management topics, as delivered by Tuck. And those, that technology has achieved a very high level of interaction and, 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 and satisfaction among students. We get as high levels of satisfaction with the teaching in that distance program as we do in our face-to-face -face program. That's bound to have an effect especially when you have students offshore doing things. 
I, I predict that in 10 years, most top schools will have parts of classes being taught while students are elsewhere. And so I, there is absolutely no doubt that 10 years ago, 10 years from now, there will be a tremendous amount of technology for the delivery of a lot of what we do. I don't foresee the time when that face-to-face -face and that camaraderie and that networking that's created at a school like Tuck will, will not be valuable. So I think that our campuses and our gathering places will be important for a long time, but it's going to be hybrid going forward. I, I, I think most programs will have pieces and small and big parts that will be delivered to people that are not sitting in that classroom, they'll be sitting somewhere else. And, um, and I, we have to figure out ways of making that valuable and, and making sure that it's still personal. I don't like I, the stories I hear about people putting things up book-wise and then no one comes to a class. That doesn't sound to me like that's a viable model or even, a, even necessarily good education. But it happens, and it's happening now. But there's certain education that may be more amenable to that, really technical things, technical coverage of technical things where leadership and interfacing doesn't mean much. But that certainly isn't management. I mean, I think management, the definition of management is working with people, making them, you know, making them achieve what they can achieve and making the organization better. It's hard to believe you could do that all at a distance. I, I don't think so. I agree. I think it's inevitable. Soon, Scotty will be beaming you up, but uh, I think uh, a, a steady diet of, of uh, electronically delivered programs is probably not in order in building the, the complete potential yeah. manager. And I think we have to be careful that just transfer of knowledge doesn't become the hallmark of higher education, because that can be delivered in many, many ways. But there's a lot more to becoming a great leader, a great manager, of great businesses than, than just the knowledge part. The knowledge is extremely important, but it, it, it isn't everything. And, and there's a lot of interpersonal skills that are developed in these campus experiences that I think will be valuable for a long time into the future and won't be able to be substituted for by, by technology. Well, final prepared question. I, I, I have to disclose that because Paul and I have known each other for so long, and I, I, I know he'd be a good sport about this, I've introduced a number of questions that weren't prepared questions. He's handled them every bit as well as the prepared ones. Uh, this CNL segment uh, is titled, Is the MBA at Risk? Uh, would you share what you think business schools must pay attention to in order for the MBA to maintain its relevance and value to business and society? How will the MBA be different 10 to 20 years from now? I think that, as I said before, I think that business education in the broad sense will become more important to the world and within the great universities. I think there's a lot of pressure to make things relevant for undergraduates and for people taking all kinds of other courses, medical, engineering, I think law. I think they're coming our way. In, in a sense. Yes. Or they're going to build their own, but I think they're coming our way. So the, our kind of uh, ecosystem, I think we're going to be much more integrated into the university in the future, much less isolated as a professional school. The MBA itself and its kind of cousin programs, like the Masters of this and the Masters of that, and those kinds of programs, I think are going to be extremely important how education is integrated into undergraduate education more than it is now. Of course, now it's probably the dominant major in many, many, many universities. Uh, the top business schools tend to be freestanding with their degrees and not usually not include an undergraduate major, but sometimes they do. Uh, so I think that the MBA, the big, the big onslaught, is going to be cost pressure mingled with distance and hybrid delivery. And I think there's going to be a time 
when there's a lot of competitive pressure from low cost providers and people experimenting yeah. with low cost, even big brand names will experiment with low cost or middle, middle brand names will experiment with low cost. I think it's going to come back though too. There is no substitute for that transformational experience you get when you show up on a September day and you are sitting with that 300 or so MBA candidates who have been selected and who are motivated and who are ready to change their lives. I think there's nothing like it. And I, I think even after a period of kind of challenge from these other delivery schemes, I think there'll always be a place for that peak experience. That, that's my guess. I'm very bullish. Now, even if that, even if we slip a bit on that front, I think the business education industry is going to be massive in the top best providers, the people with the best professors, the best people to be engaged are going to be very successful. So I'm not, I'm not worried about management, graduate management education as an entity, but I even believe the more narrow classic MBA full-time experience, I think it's going to win out in the end. As long as we're all human beings, <laughs> you know, as long as, 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 as something that isn't invented to substitute for that kind of personal development, personal networking, I think we're going to be doing it for a long time in the future. Well, I hope so. One thing we can all agree on is that the market will decide. It always does. Well, we've, um, we've uh, spent a lot of time on prepared and ad lib questions, but I, I want to take a couple of questions from uh, the audience, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll go a few minutes longer. But I, I think this one's interesting. A, a member in Indonesia asks, what do you think of the opinion that only the top-tier MBA programs within each country or in the world will survive in the, uh, in the future of the Google? CEO's postulation at some that point. Well, I, it, I don't think that's true unless these schools want to get into massive numbers, which has never been part of, of the way universities have gone to market, the top universities. I don't think that my peer schools will want to have 150,000 graduates a year. And that's what it would take for, for, it to be, for the ground to be covered. And so it may not be quite as narrow as only the ones that fit in campus are the ones that get it. There may be some other programs, but I think even they will be limited in numbers. It won't be thousands, it will be hundreds that are doing it by, at a distance. At the top, now of course there's going to be people who are going to try to sell something with 100,000 people watching a screen. And that might be popular for a while because there are some great personalities. That I have some that you could, put, you could use that way. But it won't be the kind of education that has the highest payoff, has the highest value. So I don't, I don't believe that is true, that only a handful of the big brand name schools will survive. There's just too many good programs. And I've been to a lot of programs, as you said. I, I've, been, I've participated with AACSB in reviewing a lot of schools. That's a lot of good educational efforts in a lot of schools. And people are getting very good value in many, many places. And I don't think it's, I don't think that it's that concentrated. I don't think it's, the main thing is I don't think that the quality would, would hold up. People, this thing, probably will be self-defeating if schools try to cover too many people. People will not get personal attention and they'll not get, they'll get transfer of knowledge. But take it from me, a person who went part-time for my initial MBA, it's, it's difficult if you're working full-time to get the kind of experience you get at a full-time uh, program where you clear the decks and you're engaged in this transformation. It's a different kind of experience. I don't think they're substitutes. No, that is a choice. Uh, some hold the opinion that companies have shifted their responsibility, heard this complaint before, 
of on-the-job training of new hires to MBA programs, uh, placing more burden on schools and students. <laughs> what are your views on this? I can hardly wait for this response. Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> I mean, uh, th there's some truth to that. But I don't see any um, lessening of the necessity for continuing education. And so it, 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 every, the stakes are always raised. The people that go into great jobs in the world from the MBA program are expected to know a lot, and they're expected to be at a certain level of development. But guess what? In two or three years, they're going to be expected to know a lot more. They'd better keep up. Now, like as I said before to another question, I think one of the problems is people, we need to develop better programs for continuing education that make it appealing and make it, you know, feel, feel like it's necessary. Uh, it's part of uh, uh, making sure MBAs know that there's no stopping of education. It should be a continuous process. You really should go back to the well periodically and get challenged by the great people and great professors. Uh, I think we have to form more ways for MBAs to do that. Well, if we look at some of the great companies of today, if we had trained them for their immediate needs 10, 15 years ago, they, those individuals might be uh, uh, unemployed. We're, we're training individuals, developing them for leadership and adaptability in the long run. But uh, I, I have to agree, there is a market for those programs uh, for some. Well, Director Sari, I think uh, this is going to be our last question because we've we've certainly gone over our time, but it's been for a wonderful uh, it's been for a wonderful experience and exchange. Uh, another member asks, "Is there a brighter future for specialized graduate management degrees than the generalized MBA? For example, healthcare management, innovation management, finance, arts management. What is cybersecurity management? It's another one. What what are your thoughts on that?" Well, one of the strengths of the classic MBA is that you can specialize, even if it's not officially stated as a major. You have a year of general, more or less, and then you have a year you could basically, in most of the programs I know, you can specialize all you want. If you want to be in one of those areas, schools offer courses in that. And more and more, the students, like in our case, we have a healthcare group club and a group that actually bring in speakers in healthcare. We teach courses in healthcare management, but it's part of the MBA program. You won't see on your diploma that you've got a major in healthcare, but your, your experience and your, the courses you've taken give you that kind of knowledge. So I think most programs are flexible enough to allow you to get special knowledge in a special area just by selection of electives and by being members of certain clubs and certain centers that most schools have. Now, I'd say if you want to specialize, say you want something on sustainability, you, you love sustainability issues, and if you look at a school's roster and you talk to the admissions people and they can't say anything about sustainability, I'd say find a school that can. Uh, but you don't need a degree in sustainability. I think, as I said before, the MBA is the stem cell of higher education. It's the most flexible. I would stick with that and then have a subspecialty. But in a program that gives you that general knowledge, that's the, I think that would be my strategy, as opposed to trying to find a specialized master's degree in a topic. To me, that narrows you down. You don't know what you're going to be wanting to do in five years or 10 years. The MBA, a more beautiful atmosphere for all. So I think it's healthy as Paul has, has convinced us today. Uh, Paul, I want to thank you so much. This has been every bit the experience that I anticipated it would be. You've done a wonderful job, and, and we thank you so much for venturing from uh, the uh, near Arctic environs. No, 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 to, no, 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 subarctic. <laughs> thank you, John. Well, thank you. And thank you to our, our audience, or, or for everyone that's viewed this program or around the world, um, for joining us uh, in this very interesting discussion with uh, Dean Paul Danos. Now, please mark your calendars for the next broadcast of VNL, which is scheduled for March 4th. Uh, Richard Sorensen, 
who's the dean of the Pamplin College of Business of Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, and also chair of the AACSB Blue Ribbon Committee on Accreditation Quality, will be sharing insights on the proposed new AACSB accreditation standards that will come up for vote this April in Chicago. Be sure to visit our website for further information on this and previous episodes of ENL, and I thank you and have a great day.